because of the kind of stories I'm telling with Star Wars, I'm forced to move the medium forward in order to tell my stories. Uh, if I would stay in a more traditional kind of filmmaking, I wouldn't have to worry about any of this. After I finished the original series, I had been so frustrated with the fact that I couldn't really do a lot of things that I'd imagined. I was stuck with rubber puppets. I was stuck with people wearing rubber masks. And it was very limited in how I could actually tell a story. On episode one, we basically had more freedom than George ever had on the original Star Wars film. And that's really due to digital technology. The Star Wars universe offers you limitless opportunities for innovation because there are no rules. The secret to film is that it's an illusion. You have the illusion of movement. You have the illusion of space and time. It's funny, the, the images that you see on the screen are nothing like what it is to actually do it. You know, they often can be so, oh wow, that looks really neat, but what it's involved is, you know, maybe 40, 50, 60 people working on that thing for weeks and weeks, and then you just think, oh boy, that's a neat explosion, but what it's taken to get that has been a lot of different talents from a lot of different people. Up till now, everybody's been constrained by the compromises you have to make because you virtually couldn't build something so big or you couldn't have such an epic landscape to tell your story in. That was the fun part of writing this project is that I wasn't limited. Whatever my imagination could come up with, I just put down on the page and I said, we'll worry about this later. It became pretty clear up front, this is going to be unlike any other special effects movie ever done. To put it in perspective, a big film has maybe 250 uh, effect shots, and a really monster film like Titanic will have 450, 500. But it was really clear that George was thinking about somewhere between 1,700 and 2,000 shots. And the thing that I, I, I was most afraid of was, can ILM do it? Could any effects house do that? We went out to the ranch and saw 3,500 storyboards, all pasted up on sheets of foam core. And George took us through all the boards, one by one, kind of taking us through the story and giving us a general idea of what was required. And my reaction, just about every board was, well, that's going to be really hard. And before you even have time to, to think, he's on to the next one, that's another. Well, there's 2,000 characters in that shot, and <laughs> then we were on to the next one. And so it was a pretty overwhelming experience. Yeah, we all know that Jar Jar is not real. He's a hand puppet. <laughs> <laughs> we were just, just blown away. Um, the first few meetings were just trying to get a sense of what these might look like and how many characters might be needed or how many models and how, which direction we were going to go. It was just staggering. After we do the storyboards, the next step is to put those storyboards into motion because the storyboard really doesn't tell you much. But until we actually do the moving version of that, then we can really tell how it all fits in the movie and whether we really want the shot or need the shot. This one's okay, but then these guys going that way, but that one is kind of, you don't need it, it's too crowded in there. Just about every shot in the film has blue screen or a CG alien that needs to be added. Right now they're all kind of going towards the... Hand. No, they should all go towards the starting line. Okay. Because they're all going to the bleachers. They're all going to the... Right. This is all the people who are going to watch the race. Right. We are called upon to provide something as a communication tool and something as a design tool. And then as we drive, he's you know galloping around enthusiastically, anticipating. I could go out with a camcorder. We could very quickly and very inexpensively shoot these elements and put them together in a reasonable fashion. Let's run the wind machine. The pod race started out as a collection of shots of every racing object I could find. Some of it was shots I made myself of my son. You could make a judgment as to the speed of the elements in the shot, as to whether the action worked. You could pick camera angles and experiment with them. It was like making movies in my backyard again when I was a kid. The whole idea of pre-visualization is that you can then look at what it is you're doing, and then before you start spending big money, you've already done the creative part. I could show them a very articulate shot of exactly what I wanted, how long it was, and what all the movement was in the frame. The pod race was one of the first concepts that we saw together as an animatic, and we said, how are we going to possibly do this? So in a case like the pod race hangar, 
we shot a number of the full-size pod racer engines in a stage in Leaveston. As we were shooting, it was my job to try and make sure that we had all the pieces we needed to put the shot together later. There was a huge crew, lots of computers, lots of wires, and lots of guys hunched over these machines. And I thought, well, I know they have to do with the film, but I don't quite want to know what they're up to. We used whatever would work. We used uh, the oldest of the old techniques, miniatures and matte paintings. And we used the newest of the new. We wrote a lot of new software on the show to be able to do some of these shots. Like uh, a droid gets, gets cut in half and the pieces fall on the floor and bounce. Physical simulation was something we'd never really tackled like this before. These guys over here are building this wonderful model, five people building a model for three weeks that then goes to a pyrotechnic guy and there's a camera crew shooting it and they blow that thing up. It was important to be able to mix and match without really being able to tell that this was computer graphics or that this was a model or that this was live action. To create CG characters, alien characters, who could interact seamlessly with live actors was the dream. The Bulbazel is going to win, I think. <laughs> oh, oh. In terms of Jar Jar's performance, it really all started with Ahmed Best. He would play the scene with the actors. So I blocked it out and I directed the actors and Ahmed the way I wanted the scene to be played. I hired Ahmed because he is very physical and he can act with his body. You kind of come over here next to the Jedi. Yeah. So we have Ahmed motion capture applied to the Jar Jar model, but we haven't done any of the gears or the hands or anything yet. Yeah. Okay, that's that's what we get from yeah. Tom and it's a slightly different walk we had him do. It's nice that his neck kind of sticks out more than a normal person would. Yeah. Ahmed's performance was really a reference. Typically what we did is we blocked in the work very quickly. Very, very rough, no facial animation, no overlapping action. You can think of them as a three-dimensional object, like our own bodies that have bones in them. And what we're able to do is grab, say, a wrist and move it and then pose the other hand and then pose the head and you can have the character locked in space for one frame. And then they give me another more articulate version down the road that's got, uh, you know, eye movement, lip movement, uh, hands. So it can make some little So it can make some little Here, if you watch his mouth, I can change the percentage of this shape and change the look of his mouth. And you know, the interesting thing is in the reaction, it seems like his eyes go back, see? Yeah. Rather than forward. They go forward. The, the, the initial thing has to be forward. The difficult thing is creating a performance from a wireframe model on a computer. A performance that is as rich and as human and as dignified as any other character that we have in the movie. You won this small toss outlander, but you won't win the race. So it makes a little difference. That digital character that doesn't exist has to hold his own with Liam Neeson. What's this? A local. Let's get on. This isn't a group of computer geeks. These are serious guys who understand performance, subtlety, behavior, pacing, um, all the elements of storytelling. Uh -huh. George continued to direct into the editing room. The filming was far from over. He got new ideas constantly, and he had no qualms about saying, let's figure out a way to do it. Well, if we wanted to cheat it, we would obviously we could crop it up slightly and get those guys going off to the side out. We've been able to manipulate the images within the frame of the shots, not just using take one or take seven or take three, but we can actually take the best of all those takes and make a uh, sort of a super take. George at one point had turned around and said he wanted to introduce uh, R2-D2 and C-3PO into a scene that hadn't been scripted that particular way, which is actually in the hangar. And uh, there is a shot, which is a static shot, which we literally panned off of it. We had the art department fill in the background. We had the ILM shoot the uh, blue screen elements of R2-D2, C-3PO. And it made me cry when that shot came out because it's so beautiful. I'll tell you later. Good morning. 
My space travel sounds rather perilous. The analogy really is of a painting, an enormous painting. You look at any individual shot, and it's amazing what's jammed into each frame of this movie. You're actually bombarded with it the first viewing. You have to see the film two or three times. It's so dense. There's so many different things that are going on in each frame. There's one shot that I just love. It's a helicopter shot establishing Theed. It's way too short for me. I've seen it 25 times. I still can't see everything I want to see. It was like building Venice, to build a city, a, a classical renaissance city of the future or the past. It was, it was fabulous. The biggest challenge is producing the volume of effects and keeping the quality level up. Any show that we do, typically there's a couple aspects of it that are something that haven't been done, hasn't been done before. And on this show, there were probably two dozen. Uh -huh. So dealing with fabric simulation, you know, how the cloth folds and how it reacts to the movement. Extremely dense, complex scenes with hundreds or thousands of characters. Synthetic terrain generation. The pod race is an incredible accomplishment. Virtually everything, the sky, the terrain, the pod, the engines, and the digital characters, the CG alien characters that actually fly the machines, are completely created by a group of artists. Nothing like that has ever been attempted before. There's an old cliche that says the, uh, you know, the, the best compliment you could ever get is that nobody knew there were effects in the picture. You know, I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, I also really like working on the really bold stuff, like racing through the desert at 600 miles an hour and things crashing and exploding. There's nothing like, you know, 4,000 Gungans fighting 4,000 droids. That's just really neat. In an odd way, George's concept for Star Wars, for this new film, is very much in line with what he wanted in the first films. But that vision has now been released. A lot of people were very, very nervous in the beginning of this, but everybody has come through in the most amazing way. The, the process of filmmaking has turned a corner. We are in the world of digital cinema. That's going to open up a lot of opportunities for people to more fully express their ideas. With the synthetic way that we're doing these, you know, we can really give the emotion to the scene that is appropriate for the film. The palette is being extended for artists to a, to a huge level. As long as we don't forget the story and the characters that are involved, great things are going to be achieved in the next couple of years in filmmaking. It's a very exciting time to be in films now. And action. Great cut. <laughs> George said something scary a few weeks ago. That he felt like he held back in a few places on episode one. That gave us all a bit of a scare. <laughs>